Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu-rays here. And today I'm talking about some Warner Archive Blu-rays and a couple uh, from uh, Draft House Films. A couple documentaries that I think are very interesting and worth your time. Um, we'll do those last. But let's start with some exciting uh, Warner Archive releases. We have one of my favorites uh from robert mitchum uh this is angel face from i want to say 1952 and um directed by otto preminger a great noir starring mitchum and gene simmons and uh it is it is really interesting uh also stars herbert marshall uh mona freeman Barbara O'Neill, Kenneth Toby, uh, and it is about a guy played by Mitchum who is an ambulance driver. He's a former race driver uh, with an eye on saving enough money to start his own specialty garage that will work on race cars specifically. And uh, so he was a racer. He was a tank driver in the war. And he comes back and he's driving an ambulance. And we open with him and his partner, Kenneth Toby, showing up on a call at a big mansion. Uh, and it appears that the woman of the house uh, has either attempted to commit suicide or there was an accident with her fireplace gas key. And if you're not familiar with this, basically when people in this period had gas fireplaces, they had a key they could turn to turn the gas on to light it, I guess. And, you know, turn the key off to stop the gas. But it's a very convenient thing for also attempting to kill people, apparently, uh, because if you turn it on and just let it run, you can, it's like, you know, leaving the oven open or you know, whatever. And so there's a little unclear situation in terms of what happened it, it, did someone try to kill her or was this woman uh trying to kill herself uh she is the i believe stepmother now i'm gonna i'm gonna mess up the relationship here of um of gene simmons who uh her dad is played by herbert marshall yeah she's the stepmother because she's a she was a widow and Herbert Marshall was a writer who married this widow and she's rich. And so he's kind of stopped writing. And now uh, Gene Simmons lives with them and she's kind of a spoiled, kind of creepy gal. Um, but so she sort of immediately takes a liking to Mitchum and, you know, ends up sort of following him uh, after he leaves their place and he goes back to a coffee shop to call his girlfriend. She doesn't answer. Gene Simmons walks into the coffee shop, uh, diner or whatever, and then Mitchum, she starts flirting with Mitchum, and suddenly he's, like, not so interested in his girlfriend anymore. His girlfriend's played by Mona Freeman, um, his girlfriend Mary. And so he's kind of a, you know, he's not necessarily on the up and up with his gal. Um, so he, you know, takes Gene Simmons out, to get a drink and then go dancing all the while telling his girlfriend he was just tired and he's going to go home. Uh, and so that's an interesting development and they start talking about stuff. He tells her about his dreams and, but it starts getting weird the next day when she, Jim, Jim Simmons figures out who his girlfriend is and calls on her and has her have lunch with him and basically rats him out for having taken her out. But she tries to couch it in this way. That's like, I only am telling you this because I want to give you some money that you can then give to him for his garage. I'd like to help him out, but I don't think he'll take it. And she's like, well, I don't think your, your whole thing here is actually on the up and up. I think you're trying to shake my faith in him and you've done that. Uh, but I can't take the thousand dollars. There'd be no way to make an excuse for it. And anyway, good day. So she, she bails on her and Gene Simmons clearly has like some kind of scheming going on you know so she starts to go after Mitchum and she even goes so far as to invite him to be their chauffeur he becomes more and more involved with her and they continue this idea of him having a garage maybe her her rich stepmom will give the money he even has a business plan blah 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 so it goes from there and 
it just kind of gets more and more twisted and darker and ends in a very memorable way. Um, and it's just one of the, <laughs> it's kind of crazy how it goes. And I'm definitely not going to talk about that, but it's, it's, you won't soon forget it. Uh, but it's a very interesting movie and an interesting production. It's produced by Howard Hughes, who was, I think if I'm remembering right, he had bought out Gene Simmons' contract, uh, and he had a lot of crushes in Hollywood. Gene Simmons was one of them. And she went ahead and cut her hair short to spite him, uh, as I recall, So, because he liked women with longer hair. So she has to wear this wig through this whole movie that, I didn't notice, I'll be honest, the first time, but now when I watch the movie, I see it and I go, okay, maybe that definitely looks like a wig. Um, but I did think it was interesting. Uh, Preminger, kind of a jerk as a director in general. Um, definitely hard to work with, definitely a screamer. And apparently there's a story about him making Mitchum do a take. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, when Mitchum comes to the place. Gene Simmons is kind of hysterical about this whole situation with her stepmom and she's freaking out and he slaps her and then she slaps him back. Um, but you know, that's apparently part of the medical procedure book at the time you were to slap people to stop hysterics. Uh, but so there's a story that, uh, Preminger basically made him do a bunch of takes of that slap because he was, I guess, trying to be mean to, Gene Simmons, I think under the guise of or demands from uh, Howard Hughes, just go ahead and and abuse her. I don't know how it was put, but basically Mitchum then turns and slaps Preminger and says, is that how you'd like me to do it? And Preminger immediately flips out and goes to Hughes and wants Mitchum fired. And, and Hughes is like, no, nope, can't do that. Uh, so they just kind of have to go with it. But it doesn't sound like it was a great set, necessarily. Uh, but, you know, good cast and a fun noir story, not like too many I've ever seen. So I'm a big fan of this one, and um, really nice to see it on Blu-ray. It looks lovely. It is a commentary by film noir historian and TCM host Eddie Muller, uh, which is fantastic, and I absolutely love it. The stories that I'm mentioning are definitely covered in his commentary and then some, and this is a rare, you know, archive disc that has a commentary it's been ported over from a previous release but it is you know one of the best guys doing a commentary that's eddie muller the czar of noir himself so great disc you know definitely one of my favorites of 2023 so far uh high recommend uh angel face also high recommend uh we have caged from 1950 now this is directed by john cromwell who um you know, did uh, some other movies, Dead Reckoning with Bogart and uh, Elizabeth Scott, Since You Went Away, Prisoner of Zenda, The Racket. You know, he's sort of a journeyman, right? Um, this is definitely my favorite of his films, and it is one of the most dark and brutal film noirs about women in prison, and even... I think ranks as maybe the best women in prison film ever made. I would go that far for me anyway. I mean, I just think it's really remarkable and stark and just sobering. Um, it's from 1950. Uh, it stars Eleanor Parker. Uh, Agnes Moorhead is the um, warden of this prison. Um, but it's based on a story called women without men by Virginia Kellogg. And the studio, studio originally intended it to be a vehicle for Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, but reportedly Davis had said she did not want to make a Dyke movie. That's her words, not mine. Uh, and she was against a film with lesbian content and turned it down. So I think the movie is better for it. Ultimately, I think Eleanor Parker is incredible in this movie. I really think uh, that she really sells the naivete, innocent, sad, overwhelmed uh, w woman who's sent to prison. She's a 19-year-old named Marie Allen, and it's after a botched armed robbery with her husband, Tom, who's killed in the robbery, and basically it's a gas station holdup, we find out, and she's in the car when he go goes to rob the gas station, 
uh, I guess an attendant hits him over the head, presumably killing him, but she gets out to help him. And then she's seen as an, an accessory. And the movie opens in this really dark way with, we're in the back of the paddy wagon, basically being taken to prison. And she just looks stunned and kind of like bewildered and terrified rightfully so because she doesn't even really understand what's going on you know it's just beyond her no no one in her family has ever been arrested she doesn't have a history of criminal behavior and she talks about the background of why they ended up in the position to have to try to rob that gas station it was a desperate you know uh situation and so she's very sympathetic in that way and so we see her you know going through the whole getting booked put into the prison and they talk about take you know they take all her valuables they uh ask her about her crime and she explains it and nobody's particularly sympathetic to her because they've heard of all before and some of the women criminals that are getting dumped in with her are you know second third time uh offenders they're career criminals they're um not nice necessarily she does make some friends ultimately in the prison and that helps um She meets a murderous shoplifter played by Betty Gard who helps her. Um, But it's, it's a dark, dark movie because you just feel so for this woman and you can relate to her kind of being just completely traumatized by this whole situation. Uh, As I said, Agnes Moorhead plays the warden. She's a little sympathetic, um, to her plight she says she can get paroled in 10 months but there is a lot of bad stuff to come in this prison and a lot of great you know dark criminal female characters and of course there is some uh, other stuff that happens typically in these kind of movies and you know it's it's pretty racy for a 1950 film ultimately in a lot of ways not just that content but in general it's just so dark uh, and, you know, right at the top, this is not a spoiler because she finds out right away she's also pregnant uh, and she's two months pregnant. And she even if she got out in 10 months, she would still obviously have had the baby and have to have it in prison. So just this woman's, you know, not in a great place. And like I said, it's it's really well done. And the other um, criminal women that are involved in in the story are all convincing and interesting and compelling. And I just think it's, it's really something else, you know, um, will she come out a woman or a wildcat trumpeted the ads for this woman behind bars classic. There's no question about how the film itself turned out using the familiar, but sharply played characters. Cage remains a pivotal genre classic best Academy, best actress Academy award nominee, Eleanor Parker portrays the inmate whose transformation from sunny Innocent to tight-lipped worldwide con provides its focus. As the typical floor uh, matron, best supporting actress nominee Hope Emerson is six foot two of grade A malevolence. And an earnest prison superintendent, a sour lifer, a street lamp tramp, a patsy, a society dame, and other types add atmosphere to Oscar-nominated script co-written by Virginia Kellogg. Kellogg uh, researched while posing on the inside as a convict. So I think that's interesting and definitely part of the reason this feels so real and so dark. Um, Yeah, really, really something special. Looks great on this Blu-ray. And um, in terms of features, we have Screen Directors Playhouse Radio Broadcast from 1951, classic Warner Brothers cartoon Big House Bunny, and the trailer. Uh, And I do love it when they include the cartoons. This definitely needs some levity. Uh, but it is great. Like it is really, truly one of the great noirs and one of the great prison films I've ever seen. Um, so really happy to have this on a Blu-ray between this and Angel Face. Um, already a couple of my favorites that were not on Blu-ray now getting Blu-ray releases. So very happy about those. Uh, moving on, we have The Damned Don't Cry. This is a Joan Crawford movie. Um, it is directed by Vincent Sherman. Uh, Vincent Sherman actually does a commentary on this Blu-ray. This is another one where they've been able to port over uh, the commentary, I believe, from a, um, a DVD release. And it's great to hear an old uh, Hollywood director giving his comments about everything from where they filmed things to uh, how professional Joan Crawford was and you know little bits about the plot. And 
it's it's really a neat commentary. Um, Sherman did stuff like Mr. Skeffington, Affair in Trinidad, uh, The Garment Jungle, Adventures of Don Juan, Nora Prentice. Um, again, another journeyman type, you know, guy. And I think this is probably one of his better movies. Um, it is, well, I'll, re- I'll read the back because it sums it up well. It's a man's world and Ethel Whitehead learns there's only one way for a woman to survive it. Uh, be as tempting as a cupcake and as tough as a 75 cent steak. It is the f- in the first of three collaborations with Jack- director Vincent Sherman. Joan Crawford brings hard-boiled glamour and simmering passion to the role of Ethel, who moves from the wrong side of the tracks to a mobster's mansion to high society, one man at a time. Um, some of those men love her, and one high-rolling racketeer abuses her. When the racketeer murders his rival... In Ethel's swanky living room, she flees a sure murder rap right back to poverty she thought she escaped, and this time there may not be a man to pick up the pieces of her shattered life. Um, That is one plot synopsis I saw, but another is that um, this movie was, in fact, based on the... um, it's based on the the real life story, sort of, of was it Legs Diamond? I'm trying to remember if it was Legs Diamond or um, uh, let's see here. I'll find it. But anyway, point being is that it is does have some. The plot is loosely based on the relationships b- between Bugsy Siegel and Virginia Hill. Um, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, so, but anyway, it starts. It's a little bit like. Uh, Mildred Pierce in some ways because it starts with her uh, sort of improv well it's a we get a sort of flashback narrative it opens in a cool way with like a surveyor guy surveying you know outside Palm Springs in the desert highway and he looks through his little viewfinder thing and he sees a body of a guy laying by the side of the road and it becomes like who killed this guy and then it's like we're starting to slowly unravel the mystery of who she is and what her involvement of this in this crime might be. And we flash back to, we see her parents and we flash back to her living with her parents and her then husband and their child and them living in, you know, pretty poor conditions. And there's an incident with the child and she basically decides that she's leaving. She's not going to live this way anymore and she's not going to be, um, abused or, uh, made to, feel terrible by her husband anymore and so she's leaving and and so it's again like Mildred Pierce she sort of finds her way into odd jobs becomes a model uh finds her way into the world of some gangsters and it kind of goes from there um but I always find Joan Cromford convincing and enjoyable in roles like this like she just really it's, it's something she does well I think and uh so it's a solid you know story in that sense um But she basically ends up meeting this mobster named George Castleman, played by David Bryan, and this is where everything starts to go wrong. But it is a cool noir wraparound sort of narrative where, you know, like I said, it starts at the end or, you know, towards the end and jumps back and comes forward again. And I've always liked noirs that do that as well. Um, So this one has uh, the commentary by director Vincent Sherman, which is cool. Featurette, uh, the Crawford formula, real and real, uh, R-E-A-L and R-E-E-L. Uh, Screen Directors Playhouse radio broadcast from uh, April of 1951 as well. I do like the radio broadcasts. Those are always fun. Uh, they often include the original cast, but sometimes they include other cast members as well, other people playing those roles. Anyway, this is a cool one from uh, Vincent Sherman and Joan Crawford. Uh, okay, so moving on. We have Dangerous When Wet. This is a uh, musical, and it stars uh, the popular uh, Esther Williams. Um, And she is part of a health-conscious dairy farming family, the Higgins. And they, (laughs) they start each day with invigorating swim and calisthenics. The patriarch is played by the great, uh, Bill Demarest, um, and it's, it's talking about sort of one day, a traveling health tonic salesman, um, 
comes to town and he's played by Jack Carson, who is the perfect guy to play this character. Um, he suggests they could, uh, they could swim the English channel and sponsored by a liquid pep, uh, his, one of his tonics or something and coached by himself, the family arrive in Europe and there it is decided that, uh, Basically, Esther Williams is the only one strong enough to enter the contest. But while she should be focused on, you know, the difficult and risky task ahead, she is pursued by a dashing Frenchman, uh, you know, and that so that's sort of the general bones of the plot. But it's it's much more of a musical and it's a very colorful musical that the transfer looks lovely. Uh, it includes a really great and, and I believe a pretty early, this film was from 1953, pretty early um, live action mixing with animation sequence with uh, cartoon characters Tom and Jerry. And that is definitely one of the most memorable sequences in the film. Um, and it is, it's pretty cool, I gotta say. Um, this has got a neat function in that it allows you, if you're into the musical aspect of it, it has a song selection area so you can pick the song you want to uh, listen to or just that section go right to that chapter um esther williams is dangerous when wet in uh, is a delight to watch as she swims her way to romance and competitive glory esther plays a farm girl travels with her family to england to take part in a swimming competition across the english channel there she finds more than she bargained for a romance with a dashing frenchman fernando lamas and the opportunity to perform a water ballet with cartoon legends tom and jerry one of the best live action and animated sequences ever filmed agreed uh, taking part in the splashy fun are Jack Carson as Esther's coach, Dennis Darcel as an amorous competitor in the swimming contest, and Charlotte Greenwood and William Demarest as Esther's supportive parents. The film boasts delightful songs by Arthur Schwartz and Johnny Mercer and became one of the most popular of Esther Williams' aquatic MGM musical hits. No surprise there. Um, special features include C'est La Guerre, an unused musical outtake with Darcel and Lamas, Classic Tom and Jerry cartoon, The Cat and the Mermouse in HD. Classic Pete Smith specialty short, This is a Living. And audio-only demo recordings of lyricist Johnny Mercer. An audio-only interview with Esther Williams and Dick Simmons. So that is uh, Dangerous One Wet. Very good looking Blu-ray. And then lastly, in terms of Warner Archive, we have uh, Hey There, It's Yogi Bear. This is a... Uh, uh, cartoon feature and I want to say it's one of uh, Hanna-Barbera's first actual feature cartoons uh, Spring is in the air and love is in bloom for Cindy Bear when Yogi who's smarter than the average bear plays Robin Hood Ranger Smith ships him away from Jellystone to the San Diego Zoo or so he thinks Cindy hitches a ride to find Yogi in California and ends up captive of the Chiseling Brothers uh, a very nefarious little circus outfit uh, in Missouri, Yogi and Boo Boo rush to her rescue and cannot fail with Yogi on the trail, and neither can you with his enduring family favorite, which was Hanna Barbera's first animated theatrical feature film. So that's very cool. So this is from uh, 1964, I guess, uh, and it's widescreen. And interestingly, instead of the Warner Brothers logo, you get the Columbia logo at the beginning of this one. Um, so I guess it's one that Warner owns, but it's uh, col Co-production with Sony Columbia, or Columbia Pictures at the time. A uh, good-looking animated Blu-ray. Looks nice. I'm a big fan of animation on Blu-ray. I'm a big fan of the ones that Warner's put out so far. You know, everything they've done has been pretty cool. Um, this looks pretty good, I gotta say. And it is interesting to watch Yogi in what is sort of an episodic movie, but ultimately has larger plots going on. So I think that's kind of neat uh, to see Yogi in a a wider scope kind of story. Uh, but yeah, it's really summed up well in that synopsis. It ends up being uh, mistaken. He didn't actually leave and he's playing somebody called the Brown Phantom so he can uh, still steal food, picnic baskets. He's got a great bit that he does as the uh, Jellystone food inspector. Uh, so he stops every car as they come in and takes something from their picnic baskets. Anyway, classic Yogi, classic Boo Boo, uh, Cindy is a lot more prominent in this and very much the love interest. And so it's cute. It's a cute um, animated film and I'm always interested in first. So it's neat that this is the first theatrical animated feature for Hanna-Barbera. 
uh, one of my favorite animation studios. Okay, lastly, we have the documentaries from uh, Drafthouse Films. I'll start with Chop and Steel. This is from this year or last year, uh, but a really great documentary about um, lifelong friends Joe Pickett and Nick Pruer. They uh, run the Found Footage Festival organization, which is basically this thing where they go and pull stuff from thrift shops, usually VHS tapes. Uh, they'll take anything from, you know, uh, training videos to, uh, you know, instructional videos and, uh, you know, just all kinds of oddball cable access recordings, anything. And they will, they basically put it together into a show, uh, about a 90 minute show, a feature length show where they have clips, they inter they come out and introduce each clip and everything is usually weird and strange and nutty. Um, if you're a fan of like everything is terrible, it's akin to those kind of things. These guys were coming up at the same time as them or maybe before I, don't, before, I don't know, but it's that kind of thing. And they're really funny guys. So, but this is a different story. This is the story of a prank that they played that went bad, but is both hilarious and scary, uh, and uplifting. And it's just awesome. So chop and steel are these two guys, this characters that they made up basically, Nick and Joe are, you know, pranksterish, and they had started doing things with morning TV shows um, where they would pretend to be characters and see if they could get booked on a show. Nick started with uh, writing a fake cookbook for Thanksgiving leftovers, and he would go on the shows and say he wrote this book, and they would always say, oh, the book's not out yet, and he would just do ridiculous, you know, ad hoc recipes putting gravy in a blender with it's it's nuts like they show clips of it and it's really funny but so they created these two characters chop and steel that are dressed like 80s uh guys zubaz pants and um skull caps and just very goofy looking but and with mustaches and so they take these guys they call themselves workout experts and they again go after the morning shows they get booked on a bunch of them and they go on and do ridiculous workouts that are completely silly. I won't even describe them because I really think it's fun to watch the workouts they've come up with because they they play it straight. They come on the show as if they are really these guys and what they're doing is really serious. And the hosts, you just have to see them react to it. And it's bizarre and hilarious. The problem is at some point, one of the parent companies of one of these uh, morning shows gets offended that they tricked their hosts and sues them. And so this movie becomes sort of the story of that lawsuit, how they dealt with it and what the outcome was. They even have like footage of their deposition testimony, which again, they aren't even trying to be funny, you know, in those scenes, but they show clips of it and the questions they're being asked and the responses they're giving because of this kind of ridiculous situation are very funny. Uh, and Nick and Joe are just very funny guys. Um, but it is a harrowing thing to think about a lawsuit like this for guys like this who are not making a lot of money with the found footage thing. And this is a very scary proposition, but again, very funny to see what they did. And they even got on America's got talent. Uh, and it's hilarious what they did for that. So it's super fun to watch them go through this thing, but also dealing with the lawsuit and the sort of humanity of these guys and what they're going through is really, uh, affecting and easy to get caught up in. So highly recommended. This is on digital as well. This includes a commentary with the directors of the doc, Bernd Mater and Ben Steinbauer, along with uh, Joe Pickett and Nick Pruer. Excited to listen to that because I'm very sure there'll be some very funny stuff in there. Uh, definitely check out Found Footage Festival on YouTube. They, they do a lot of cool stuff over on YouTube. They'll do live versions of the shows I described where they'll, come, they'll do like a VHS party and they will just play some clips that they found. Uh, they do a Saturday morning one and it's really great I highly recommend on youtube to follow them and if they do come to your town and put on one of their found footage festival shows that is also highly recommended but chop and steal one of my favorite documentaries of the last year or so and then uh really tying right in with that is another doc called life on the farm which nick and joe are also interviewed as part of this um this is a really fascinating documentary uh because it is it's just kind of wild, you know, it's just wild that 
this guy that we and the way that we get to know him I, th- I just think it's a very fascinating look at a dude that we don't really know but we get to know him through these videos so basically it's about a strange video that this director that of this documentary remembers seeing as a kid that was made by a neighbor of his on a farm and this is in england somewhere and it's the story of a man called charles carson who lived on his own farm in Somerset, England, I think. Anyway, he made a feature-length home video that sort of shows some of his day-to-day, showing uh, his horses, uh, who often steal his hats, uh, showing a cow giving birth and him actually pulling the calf out and the afterbirth and everything. And it's just getting... He's very upbeat and pleasant, but he also does weird things where he'll take video of a picture and he'll put like a little speech bubble on it and he's just there's an odd there's something kind of off but he's endearing and still makes you a little uneasy at the same time i can't explain it but he's fascinating this guy um and then we start to get into some darker stuff starts with him burying one of his cats and then his mother who he's living with his mother and father i think this is part of the reason he may have sort of gone crazy as his parents were sickly and he was alone taking care of them and then they started to die. So his mom dies and he's a picture of her dead by the fireplace and he calls a priest for a blessing and they interview the priest and then he takes her body in the wheelchair and puts it out in the pasture so she can say goodbye to the cow. Um, again, she's dead uh, and the other farm animals. Uh, so you just, it's not, he's not playing that as a joke. Like that's a genuine gesture, but it's weird. Um, and then it just gets kind of weirder. You know, his dad passes away and there's some more footage with his dad's body. And I I don't know, apparently it it just gets very odd. But what, what's interesting about it and what I think is so neat is that it starts as this one thing we were kind of like laughing at it. Then suddenly it's getting darker and more serious. You're like, oh no. And then you start to really feel for this guy and you really start to want to know more about him. And we don't have a lot of information because he's passed away. But you do interview some people that knew him. And we talked to Nick and Joe and we talked to the Everything is Terrible guys and some other stuff uh, about their takes on this footage. Um, And it's just, like I said, a fascinating documentary that ends up being really surprisingly so moving uh, by the end. You really just um, are so taken with this story that it's just like not like too many documentaries I've seen. The closest thing I could compare it to was there's a documentary that was on, maybe it's still on Criterion Channel, called Portrait of K, uh, K-A-Y-E. All about this woman in England who uh, n- doesn't like to leave her house and goes through the story of her life through videotapes and home videos and just her telling the story. Uh, and it's just really a sweet movie, and I love it. This is kind of like that, but a little different. But again, truly fascinating story of this guy and you know what went down uh with his family i'm curious life on a farm celebrates the odd life of an eccentric farmer in rural england named charles carson whose bizarre home movies has become a cult phenomenon around the world carson's life and work are remembered by those who knew him best and a new generation of fans reflect on the inspiring legacy he left behind yeah it's really an uplifting story ultimately um so this blu-ray includes a skeleton's journey an interview with cinematographer Edward uh, Lamas, interview with composer Sam Paul Thomas, interview with David The Rock Nelson, and an interview with uh, editor Hannah Christensen. So you get some special features on here. And uh, yeah, it's really something else. An interesting compliment to watch these two close together, Chop and Steel and Life on a Farm. Um, Anyway, that will do it for this video, uh, this episode. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.